I'm very, very pleased to introduce uh, uh, an eminent psychologist and a very good friend, Dr. Karan Benson from University College Dublin. Um, he did his uh, work at both uh, Sussex University and the National University of Ireland uh, some years ago. He's, he's a professor and former chair of psychology at University College Dublin. But he's very unusual in as much as he is uh, not only a scientist, but also someone who's immensely interested in the arts, former president of the Irish Arts Council, and uh, very uh, well connected in the Irish arts community as well as the international community interested in the psychology and the cognitive science of, of the arts. Um, and uh, we're very, very fortunate to have him here. It was a, a, a fortunate chance that he's, he's giving the Davis lectures at Georgetown University in Washington, happened to be in the U.S. and since he was in the neighborhood, I opportunistically invited him and his uh, wife, Viviane Roche, who's in, uh, a very well-known sculptor in Ireland, to be here for this. Um, uh, the topic that he's going to talk about is selves, subjectivity, and memory, reflections on possessing and on being possessed by memories. The latter part in particular uh, interests me since on various occasions I have been possessed by memories and owned by memories. So it's a very important topic. Um, and uh, he's going to connect this to our theme, which is the representation of time in memory. Um, since we have been talking a lot about episodic memory and the sense of your own subjective continuity of experience in your own life, which is clearly not a given and is something that is hard won in cognitive terms, I'll be very interested in, in hearing what he has to say. Go on. Thanks very much, Marlon. First of all, welcome. You can hear me okay. Uh, if Marilyn had turned his back, he would have seen that uh, I've changed the title. <laughs> <laughs> and I've changed the title for a number of reasons. It, it, when Merlin asked me a few weeks ago would I speak for an hour, I felt, what on earth could I say to cognitive scientists? Because I'm not a cognitive scientist, I'm not a neuroscientist, uh, I'm not an experimental psychologist. My background is in social psychology, and when I was in Sussex, I studied with Hans Firth, who was a, a theoretical Piagetian. And my subsequent interests have been very much in areas of philosophy of art, but also in the idea of art and society. So I did not want to in any way intrude on the expertise of, of those of you who know far more about the neuro and cognitive side of things. But on the other hand, uh, what I did feel was perhaps worth doing was trying to draw together some ideas because one of my experiences uh, in, in um, academic life is that increasingly specializations are of a kind that people are getting more and more locked into particular uh, funneled areas and less and less likely to have a chance to look outside their discipline, not least within what everybody else thinks is their discipline. And I think that is a problem. Um, what I've decided to do is focus less on time, um, but more on memory but also to make it somewhat more complex by introducing these notions of self, which Jana has mentioned before, and I know others coming after me are going to talk about this, and also the issue of memory, which, uh, which, uh, sorry, of emotion, which it seems to me terribly important, but uh, tends very often not to find uh, as significant a place, I feel, as it should. And I'm doing all this with one end in mind, and it is to, uh, first of all, I'm going to review uh, a number of things. So I, I'm going to speak in a number of parts, if I may. And the first two parts that I'm going to deal with are, are those. And my wish there is to review some problems and to suggest maybe uh, possibilities of synthesis across unlikely disciplines um, in relation to time, memory, and identity. And then in the second, which are, are three and four, uh, I've been preoccupied for a little while with the ideas of the negative things in, in, in uh, identity. And what I wanted to do there was just give you some ideas, of my own in fact, uh, in relation to the boundaries of identities. And I'll explain why I chose that when I get to it. And then for the final part, what I want to do is I want to look at one particular person uh, who some of you may know, he's the philosopher Richard Wolheim, who died about um, uh, four years back. Uh, but he was a fascinating man in a number of ways, and I'll explain why I have chosen him, because he is the one who I was going to use as an exemplar of being possessed by memory. 
So what I want to do is I want to introduce ideas that don't refer to the types of representation that Merlin's work has elaborated so well, other than to say that they tend to be coming back from the cultural towards numbers one and two as he articulated them. Um, by way of just a, a, a um, preface, um, when I was growing up in Ireland, uh, we were very much uh, under the governance of a curriculum which was geared specifically to making us certain types of people. And at that time in the 50s and early 60s, it was to make us Catholic nationalists. And th we were a very enclosed society at that time. And in the mid-60s, a paper was published by a Jesuit, as it happened, called Father Shaw, which took aim at the celebrations that were going to take place in 1966 of the 1916 rebellion. And it became the first revisionist piece of history uh, in, in uh, Ireland for many decades. And it, it became very controversial. And one of the things that I remembered from that time, and which prompts some of what I'm going to talk about, is the idea of the anger that he prompted in many people, that the ways of which he was suggesting that Irish nationalism wasn't quite as we expected prompted very visceral reactions, and, and those have continued subsequently. By, by the way, they led that particular uh, event led subsequently into uh, lots of work groups that wanted to look at the history curriculum that we had as a way of revising that so that we revised our, our idea of nationalism. And of course, that coincided with the most virulent outbreak of urban terrorism in Europe for, for decades. So there's a background to that. And that's why I've chosen Jan Asman to start with. So the sort of questions I want to ask today are how might we think about the connections between ideas of culture or collective memory and personal memory? Specifically, what might be involved in how initially external culturally fabricated memories become individually integrated personal memories? And where might we look for a good account of time, consciousness and self in that regard? Are there ideas abroad in neuroscience that might advance an understanding of how phenomenolo phenomenology tackles these issues? What about emotions and memory? Can we think of identity forming emotions as kinds of procedural memory? That's something that occurred to me and that underlay my question to Charles. Perhaps as I go on, that idea of orthopractice could become a much more fruitful one. And given the importance of re-experiencing in Tulving's sense, as Jana has outlined, uh, that idea of time travel, I'm going to suggest that perhaps there is something to learn from what I'm going to call a tick description in the Goetzean sense uh, of a case like Richard Wolheim. Because what his work, uh, the, one, the, the elements of his work that I'm going to deal with, uh, are about re-experiencing as particular sorts of memory. Uh, if we can answer those questions, what might that learning tell us about the initial question concerning the connection between externalised cultural memory and private personal identity, identity constituting and identity maintaining memories of the kind that matter emotionally to people? So there's where I'm coming from. And just to start with Jan Asman, the reason I'm choosing Asman, and, and many of you may well be familiar with his work, is because uh, it's very much in vogue at the moment in, in my part of the world, influencing lots of work, particularly in Germany, on whether uh, you can contest memory with memorials, with Holocaust Museum, and so on. Uh, so I'm just going to start, as it were, with a broad perspective on collective memory and cultural memory and move back from that. Uh, Asman, if I, by the way, this, I, I always like images, but because I'm working out of my, my apartment, I didn't have a chance, but everybody knows Dali's uh, first one. The second one comes, as Charles probably know, in, in, in a more uh, corrupting stage of his work, but where uh, he, the idea of the persistence disintegrating in that sort of atomic way with water being underwater uh, came many years after that. So my theme is the persistence and the disintegration of the persistence of memory. And I just rather like that question. What makes you tick, Mr. Daly? So let's work back from Asman. Uh, a few key ideas to take from Asman. Um, one is this idea that uh, the originators in the European context of an idea of collective memory um, or social memory, he uh, locates with Maurice Walbach's and with uh, A.B. Warburg. And essentially, uh, 
saying that uh, the late 19th century ideas of a kind that gave rise to Jung's notion of collective memory, which were assumed to be somehow biological, were not correct. And his argument was that a notion of collective or social memory had to become, or their argument was, had to become understood in terms of culture and practice. Um, but from my point of view, here's uh, one other idea that's important in, in what I would like to stress. And that is that the specific character that a person derives from belonging to a distinct society and culture is not seen to maintain itself for generations as a result of phylogenetic evolution, but rather as a result of socialization and custom. He goes on to say what he thinks uh, of, of cultural memory, and it's very like Merlin's idea. Um, suggesting that uh, it's a body of reusable texts, images, rituals, specific to each society in each epoch, whose cultivation serves to stabilize and convey that society's self-image. Uh, upon such collective knowledge for the most part, but not exclusively of the past, each group bases its awareness of unity in particularity. So he's arguing for distinctive identities that are culturally generated. And he goes on to argue that in the context of objectivized culture and of organized or ceremonial communication, a close connection to groups and their identity exists, which is similar to that uh, found in everyday memory. And he speaks then later on of this uh, uh, idea of a concretion of identity, meaning that a group bases its consciousness of that unity, their unity, their specific specificity upon the knowledge and then they derive formative and normative impulses from that, which then, and this is the point I'm interested in, allows the group to reproduce its identity. So in that sense, objectivized culture has the structure of memory and it functions in terms of the reproductions of the particular identities of that particular culture. Some features of that from his point of view uh, about he would say that cultural memory transcends the temporal horizon of everyday memory. It has its fixed points, meaning its horizon does not change with time. Uh, for example, I mean, those of you who might have been interested in the Balkans Wars would have seen the recurrence of the field of the blackbirds, the battle in the 13th century, and how fixed that was in, in the Balkans discourse of the t at the time, and how you, Radoman Karadic, who was a, 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 a poet, used all this work. Uh, these fixed points are fateful events of the past. Their memory is maintained through cultural formation, texts, rites, monuments, and so on, but also through institutional communication, recitation, practice, observance. The festivals, rites, epics, poems, and images from islands of time, uh, they, they form islands of time, but that temporality is suspended from everyday time. And he goes on to say, it preserves the knowledge from which a group derives an awareness of its unity and, pe and pe uh, peculiarity. It works reconstructively, always by relating its knowledge to an actual contemporary situation. So the idea is that just as in personal memory, cultural memory is under constant reconstruction, under the demands of the present moments or context of remembering. And it depends on specialized practices. So cultures that are predominantly reliant on written texts, for example, uh, will work differently than others. So that's all by way of going towards this particular idea from uh, Asman and, and others. And that is that the knowledge preserved in cultural memory binds its subjects in two particular ways. And one is formatively, and that is it educates water. Is, yeah, that'd be great. I'll have some water, actually. Formatively, uh, in that, thanks, Baron. It educates, civilizes, and humanizes, but also as part of that, although he keeps it separate normatively, in that it provides rules of conduct. Now, it's that idea of the normative that interests me here, and the ways in which the provision of those rules of conduct might work. So my general question is, how can a cultural memory become an identity constituting personal memory? And my tentative general answer, which I'll try to outline, is that it does that through the normative formation of emotions that form the distinctive architecture of that culture's identity. And that's a very large claim. And once again, you can see this idea of orthopractice. <laughs> 
we'll come back in there. Now, when we look, and Yana was talking about this, when you look at the philosophy of, of uh, selfhood, if you took, for example, Richard Sarabji's recent book, looking at the, the uh, classical uh, roots of selfhood, there's a constant preoccupation of time and self and of self and time, manifesting in self in questions about sameness and continuity. Uh, I just want to suggest, no more than suggest, uh, that uh, there are neural and narrative dimensions in the reproduction of self. And I'm just going to give three propositions. They would all have to be defended. But the first is that there are two kinds of reproduction, operative and selfhood. One, neural, neural forms of reproduction, and the second, narrative forms of reproduction. And the second proposition would, would be that the first proposition helps us understand kinds of self-presence and self-awareness. And again, I took that to be underlying some of the concerns that Jana had. And the third proposition, and this is the important one in terms of where I'm going, because Wolheim subscribes to what he calls a non-constructionist theory of memory, and it's one that I would also subscribe to. Self is the precondition for a memory to be a memory. You can't think of a memory without self or, or some notion of self. I mean, you can think about forms of memory and in computers and so on, but not in the way that we would use it. You need m memories need to be had. They need to be owned. So moving that along, how, if you were thinking that forward engineering way, how much you think about uh, how time, memory and self emerge in the pre-linguistic child? And again, a number of the speakers are very interested in this. So I'm just going to link three different lines of, of, of thinking here. Um, there's a very interesting book just published in the last year or two by Dan Zahavi, uh, who is a phenomenologist who works out of the University of Copenhagen, uh, Subjectivity and Selfhood. And I, I've tried to read Husserl with, with difficulty, I have to say, uh, and not least because I found I was reading texts that he himself subsequently changed, but that I didn't know about. So Zahavi has done a very thorough piece of work on this. And one of the conclusions that uh, he um, comes to in relation to Husserl is this idea that there is a givenness of selfhood and consciousness. Uh, I remember years ago when, when uh, uh, Chomsky was talking, he, uh, he was saying that there was, a, no matter how you think about it, you, there is a given duality and subjectivity. You just feel it. Uh, so the question of, of this presence of self is an interesting question because the argument here will be that it is not something that is inferred. It's not something that becomes an object of attention and is subsequently deduced to exist. So Husserl was saying that experience is constituted and he has this notion of inner time consciousness uh, and saying that it's brought to awareness by its own means. It's called inner because it belongs intrinsically to the innermost structure of the experience itself. Inner time consciousness simply is the pre-reflective self-awareness of the stream of consciousness. And Husserl's account of the structure of inner time consciousness, and he has this uh, triple dimension of retention, primal presentation of protension, that that should consequently be appreciated as an analysis of the microstructure of first personal givenness. Um, and he goes on to say, at this level, and the word Husserl is using is self-affection, there is no subject-object dichotomy. The choice of the term is motivated mainly by its ability to capture the whole range of the defining features of pre-reflective awareness, including its immediate, implicit, non-objectifying and passive nature. Now, that idea of that simply being given is an idea that uh, John Dewey, I also believe, had. And I was, in, in another life, very interested in Dewey's work. And Dewey's idea of experience was exactly the opposite of what we currently think experience is. He, by that, he meant culture, in fact. Uh, and late in his life, realized that he'd spent his entire life fighting for the wrong word. Um, but it's the idea that you read back into your experience divisions of self and other are subject and object, but that the primal givenness of that is a unity. And within that, there is self-presence. 
Now, if you go back to Philippe Rochard's work, uh, one of the things that uh, Dan Zahavi does is, is he criticizes Philippe Rochard's work on infantile experience. But I suspect before he actu Russia actually had this particular paper out, uh, five levels of self-awareness as they unfold early in life. And uh, his argument is that when infants experience their own crying, their own touch or experience, uh, the perfect contingency between the seen and felt bodily movements in a mirror, long before they can identify it as a mirror or identify themselves in it as, as separate from, from what they see, uh, they perceive something that no one but themselves can perceive. The transport of their own hand to the face, very frequent at birth and even during the last trimester of pregnancy, is a unique tactile experience, as it entails a double touch. And these basic perceptual multimodal experiences are indeed self-specifying. Uh, an abundance of experimental uh, studies with newborns and very young infants suggest the existence of early self-world differentiation. So I just wanted to connect that, since you're um, dealing with neurosciences, with uh, an idea that I always liked in Damasio. I don't know enough about the neuroscience to see uh, uh, whether it's been developed well. But uh, my impression is that it's been somewhat neglected because reading people who are uh, uh, invoking Damasio, they tend to leave out some of uh, this third dimension. And it relates possibly, I mean, Merlin will know much about this than I, but possibly to this idea of, of the, the importance of the uh, medial parts of the brain. So when, when Damasio uses that phrase, the feeling of what happens, uh, a phrase, by the way, he takes from the poet Seamus Heaney, what he's saying is that the world is the feeling of what's happening. And uh, there are different types of image that are uh, uh, constructed. There is the image of the object, there is the image of the impact of the object on the, on the organism or subject, uh, and that's separate again. But he's also su suggesting that there is an image of the organism in the act of perceiving and responding to the object. And I find that very curious, because if that is the case, uh, that actually, it seems to me, explains Husserl's idea of the uh, self-presence, the givenness of selfhood. Um, but again, I throw that out simply for discussion. I can't answer it, but it seems to me that there is something more that could be said about that. So how are we to think about time, memory, and self in relation to the pre-linguistic child? Um, I'm suggesting that the elements of that answer would include the givenness of self that serves to anchor or attach, but not to organize pre-linguistic memory. Um, I'm suggesting that it may include uh, the persuasive evidence, and I quote here from Catherine Nelson, who's done very interesting work on this, that for the child of two years, the only temporal differentiation is that of the present activity and everything else uh, that has been entered into memory as a representation of the experienced world. The young child's view is singular. There is only one perspective on the world, his or her own. So the idea that there's a single perspective, uh, the child's differentiation is, is, is now and, and the rest. So it's a twofold one. Uh, and then the question is, as the child develops, how does that change? And this goes back to Mark's point of view. Uh, her argument is the temporal perspective, my past, present and future, or the capacity for taking perspectives other than one's own, uh, coupled with the cultural modes of temporal organization, all depend on becoming skilled in language and narrative. So Catherine Nelson's uh, perspective, which uses a lot of Merlin's work, is to the effect that the divisions of time and then the consequences for self-awareness of those divisions, they're culturally supplied and they come through language and the narrative structures of conversation and subsequent rehearsal by the child on its own of conversations with caregivers and parents. Now, there's a subplot to what uh, I, I want to talk about here. And that is that the negative is hugely important in the construction of cultural and personal identity. Um, and I just now want to say something uh, about negative emotions and identities. And then when I come on to uh, talk about Richard Wolheim, I want to talk about the negative, negative events and memory. 
Now, when I'm talking about this, this is just a suggestion, but emotions seem to me to be a key part of high-level procedural memories. Now, maybe uh, trying to pirate that notion of procedural memory is, is a bad idea. Maybe I should be saying that there are uh, key parts of orthopractic uh, activities or skills. But one of the things that I want to uh, spell out f are some reflections I've had on the idea of unthinkable thoughts and identity-bounding emotions. And I'll explain what I mean by that. So just by way of saying why I'm, I'm looking at emotions in this particular way, this is a, a, a from a review paper by Levine and Pizarro about three years back. Um, and it's looking at emotion and memory research in a review uh, framework. And I'm just pointing out that the sorts of concerns to the people who are reviewed in this are not the sort of concerns that I'm suggesting may be important, uh, important as their concerns may be. We, we now know, they say, that emotional memories are not indelible. In fact, they are subject to some of the same reconstructive forces of memories uh, for non-emotional events. We also know that emotional events are remembered better than non-emotional events and that the amygdala plays an important role in this process. Considerable ac progress has been made towards identifying the mechanisms underlying uh, these findings. Now, I'm just pointing out that the underlying presumption of emotion is separate from memory here, with one influencing the other. But what of emotion as memory when approached from a subjective point of view? And that's really the next thing I want to make some comments upon. Is there an emotional architecture of self? And in both what I'm going to talk about now, just very briefly, but in Richard Wolheim's case in particular, the idea of disgust, for example, is a very important and interesting emotion. Now, I was interested, and I won't spend too long on this, on the idea of boundaries of self. Because uh, if you think of self working in a frame, and we were just talking earlier on about frames, uh, you think about boundaries. And the type of, of understanding that, uh, of a boundary that I was trying to work towards uh, moved initially from looking at these very interesting phenomena uh, like anosognosia and asomatognosia of, you know, of uh, the, the, the non-renewal of maps in the, uh, the brain, which Damasio uses to such good effect, I think, asomatognosia and, uh, and other such blind sight, other such uh, ideas of where you, where you are and where you end. But actually, from a cultural point of view, what interests me was the ways in which you extend into the world, and you extend into the world really through objects and practices and so on that matter to you. In other words, your extension into the world in a way that's important to your identity is emotional. And this is just a quote from Susan Engel's book, um, Context is Everything, the Nature of Memory. We all put ourselves at the center of action. This coincides, coincides nicely with the argument made by some that to remember is to tell a story, and all stories must have a hero. Clearly, one is always the narrator of one's memory. But what is also fascinating is that we also tend to make ourselves the hero of the past. Now, have I missed Norman Cameron, the English poet? When you confess your sins before a parson, you find it no great effort to disclose your crimes of murder, bigamy, and arson. But can you tell them that you pick your nose? And then uh, this idea of, of the trivial and the heroic uh, being a problem is something that I just felt was interesting. Here is a simple um, summary of some of the ideas that uh, Miller had from, which I think is a very fine book, The Anatomy of Disgust. Disgust along with contempt, as well as other emotions in various settings, recognizes and maintains difference. Disgust helps to find boundaries between us and them and me and you. It helps prevent our way from be being subsumed into their way. Disgust along with desire locates the bounds of the other, either as something to be avoided, repelled or attacked, or in other settings as something to be emulated, imitated or married. Now, what I want to do is I want to, to connect that uh, to this idea of the unthinkable. Um, and why do I take this idea of the unthinkable? Well, some years ago when I was 
uh, working on something, I was reading a lot of that literature that Christopher Browning and Daniel Goldhagen had used for, uh, for their work, looking at the uh, police battalions for whom evidence exists uh, about their activities in, 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 in murdering large numbers of uh, Jewish children, women and men. And uh, I came across one in particular, a man called Kurt Mobius, who was a major, who said that it was unthinkable for him not to kill Jews. So I was curious about that idea of, uh, f this idea of unthinkable as a boundary. And then subsequently, I came across the work of Harry Frankfurt uh, in Yale. Um, and I, I found his work extremely helpful. And here's just a, a simple uh, uh, summary of one of the things that he's saying. He's actually talking about the constraints that are necessary to be what you are. You won't have an identity of any identifiable kind unless you're working into, uh, uh, under very definite constraints. And he says, therefore, unless a person makes choices within restrictions from which he cannot escape by merely choosing to do so, the notion of self-direction, of autonomy, cannot find a grip. Someone free of all such restrictions is so vacant of identifiable and stable volitional tendencies and constraints that he cannot deliberate or make decisions in any conscientious way. If he nonetheless does remain in some way capable of choice, the decisions and choices he makes will be ar altogether arbitrary. Now again, Dan Dennett in his work on, on freedom and evolution, th uh, th that will be a familiar idea to you, even though I don't think he agrees with Frankfurt. But I found Frankfurt very interesting in this regard. And one of the ideas that he also uses is the idea of unthinkability. So it's possible then to think of this idea of the unthinkable as one of the elements of a boundary of identity. So for example, it would be unthinkable for the Pope to become a Protestant. You know, and that shows you what the boundaries of what it is to be a pope and the boundaries of what it is not to be a pope. Uh, there will be other categories for a pope who becomes a Protestant, but that would be uh, uh, an example. Or for most normal people, it's unthinkable that they would have sex with their children. But there are people for whom that is not unthinkable. Uh, so the identity of somebody as a paedophile would be of a kind that would, would take uh, the boundaries in one direction or uh, that of somebody who would be apparent, who found it apparent in another direction. So just very briefly, those are some examples. So for myself, I was trying to operationalize what that might mean. And I came up with this just working definition of myself, for myself. And it was an inability to vividly and realistically imagine my doing certain extreme things without at the same time having inhibitory negative feelings. Um, now, I, I don't know whether that's capable of, of being investigated, but it seems to me n not an unreasonable hypothesis. And then it followed, uh, if I was to summarize what that might mean, I, people talk about the integrity of a person or your integrity, meaning, in a sense, your oneness as this or that type of person. And I'm saying that uh, the integrity of identity is a function of the quality of your boundaries. But I'm also saying that the potency of those boundaries is a function of negative feelings that are constitutive of unthinkability. Again, that's a hypothesis. And this was an example that I tried to work it on myself. I read of Fadima Sahindal, who is in the photograph, and there, that's her, her sisters. And she was a young Turkish uh, girl who was killed in 2002 by her father in uh, Sweden. And I was curious to see how it is that you would imagine a father killing his daughter. Because for us, yet another, uh, th the idea of being a good father, or indeed being a good mother, certainly has as an unthinkable boundary that you would harm your children, or indeed that you would kill them and under certain circumstances. Um, and this is exactly what happened. Now, she, she was a very interesting person because uh, she had been going out with uh, a Swedish boyfriend. Uh, her father had taken huge, ex huge exception. He was first generation from the southeast uh, corner of, of uh, Turkey, from, from the Kurdish area. Um, and subsequently, as it happens, the boy w was killed in a car crash. But uh, she was quite estranged from her father and became an activist uh, 
who was campaigning on the uh, issue of rights to choose, not in, in, in issues of abortion or anything of that kind, but simply right to choose your own partner. Uh, and her father subsequently killed her. So uh, that led me on, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but it led me on to wondering about how this might work. In relation to uh, the idea of disgust, as those of you who know that literature, the, the fascinating work done by Paul Rosen in Pennsylvania on disgust. And we know that very quickly, the sort of contaminatory disgust that you will see in, in infants becomes socio-moral disgust. And that socio-moral disgust is very variable depending on how the norms to which it's, in, it's, to which it's recruited uh, put, put disgust as a use. So the disgust, for example, that might be underlie homophobia would be an example. So playing around with this, uh, and, and just, I'm just using this to make a general point, um, Richard Schrader had argued, the cultural anthropologi anthropologist, that you could look at the moral orders of, of, of um, communities and broadways in terms of the degree to which they stress the primacy of their, the individual members of a community becoming autonomous, uh, as against stressing the primacy of the community to which autonomy should be um, made in some way subservient. Or in a g g g cultures where divinity is the, d the dominant one. And he's arguing then that, and I, the, I've, I've reframed this, uh, he calls it the CAD uh, triad hypothesis. And this is, uh, there's some uh, support for Schrader's um, uh, uh, claims in this uh, empirical piece of work by Rosen, Paul Rosen and, and his colleagues. But uh, the idea they were playing with is community, C, A, D, divinity, and then the primacy of these particular emotions as governing them, uh, contempt, anger, and disgust. So in relation, for example, to divinity, you would think of the caste system in India. And anybody who's been to India, I, I saw an amazing example of this in a little uh, hotel, which is now gone on Sutter Street in Calcutta, where the man behind the uh, desk, and you would assume that the receptionist was higher status, was in fact Dalit and was lower, lower caste than the waiters. But the man behind the desk also uh, had uh, an epileptic condition, which they were familiar with. Uh, and he began in this little area to have a seizure one day. And he knew what he had to do. He had to, go, he had to walk over out of line of sight of the guests, tiny place. But there was a waiter walking behind him, like da Vinci, with his finger not touching him, but urging him forward. He's so literally untouchable. Um, so. You can play with these, but in, in one of the uh, arguments would be in, in what I was making uh, the case for in relation to Fadima Sahindal, was that here was somebody who was actually reared in Sweden as a young woman, as a fully Western young woman, where the stress was on autonomy. Her father, on the other hand, was reared in a highly communal patriarchal situation where the stress was quite different. And the father began to feel that he was the object of contempt, both by her, but also by people who would regard him in some way. And then you have this tectonic uh, dislocation within a family. Now, these are actually much more common cases. I don't know how common they are in the US, but they're quite common in Europe these days because of this huge division between second generation kids and first from societies like this. So I, do, I show you th in that general uh, sense those examples to suggest that emotions are hugely important, it seems to me, in constituting identities. And they are also helpfully understood as procedural because effectively there are ways of enacting a way of uh, reproducing an identity. And it seems to me that the reproduction of cultural norms through the recruitment of particular emotions and then making those very strong parts of the individual identities of the members of a, of a community uh, make that case for looking at emotion as procedural. And again, this, these are familiar things to you, but it seems to me uh, when you look at a standard division uh, of memory, declarative, non-declarative, and then the various dimensions, that there is a higher order uh, use of memory that is not being caught in those taxonomies. And if I may give you that example from a book literally just published, I just got, I managed to get the European edition, it's just out uh, to make this point. Um, this is Gail Goodman and, and Melinda, 
we propose, consistent with Tolving's 1999 formulation, that a certain degree of biological maturity is necessary before episodic and thus ep autobiographical memory is possible. To the extent that autobiographical memory is largely a form of episodic memory, although it may also have semantic components and is influenced by cognitive developmental processes, it is likely to require a certain degree of brain development, perhaps into the second to the fourth year of, 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 of life or of age. Now, the, the reason I'm showing you that is simply th these are people who've been working on uh, autobiographical memory for whom it's dominant, predominantly to be understood as episodic with some semantic dimensions. But it seems to me that uh, to understand it, as I'm suggesting, you need to understand the emotional side of things. So here are some questions. Should we think of autobiographical memory in relation to its constitution of stable narrative selfhood and in addition to being understood as a version of episodic and semantic memory as involving high level procedural memory, frontal lobes, amygdala and so on? Is, is there not a very strong how to do procedural skills based strand to selfhood? And more specifically, can we think of the particular emotional dispositions of our diverse identity constituting architectures as kinds of procedural memory, partly learned, partly self-devised scripts of action? Now I want to move on to looking at some of this in a bit in, in, the, in, in the case of one. And, uh, as I say, I'm using the phrase thick description of memory as re-experiencing using Tolving's idea. And I'm using the phrase the tyranny of the past, uh, which is a phrase used by this philosopher Richard Wolheim. And I'm deliberately again using the work and the remembered life because what I'm going to do is contrast two different texts which came from Wolheim. But before I do that, I just there's a very quick review to make this point about the importance of negative events, because I'm saying there's a subplot in what I'm talking about, and it's the importance of negativity. And again, I'm taking this from this recently um, published book on everyday memory. So these are a summary of types of, 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 of findings, and of course, like everything else in psychology, their tendencies. So highly emotional negative information is better remembered than positive or neutral. Even very young children, that is around two, can give particularly detailed accounts of negative experiences. Uh, Ledoux argued for emotion as memory, um, via the amygdala and stress hormones, creating a vividness of negative stimuli in memory. There's a tendency for adults to recall negative events as their first autobiographical memory. Arousal combined with negative personal valence appears to be the most memorable. We also know, of course, that negative emotions can impair memory. Once language is attained, children's earliest communications are almost entirely about negative events. A higher level of talk complexity between parents and children is evident when they're talking about negative feelings. Generally, more words exist in lexicons for the negative than for the positive emotions. More facial expressions for negative uh, emotions ex uh, are, are evident than for positive emotions. The suggestion that children evince more advanced theory of mind when they're dealing with negative emotional events than others. Uh, the idea that children are less susceptible to suggestion about negative events. And coming back to Jerry Bruner, who, who uh, must I must say is somebody that uh, I have found a huge amount in, in his recent work over the years. The, it's likely that negative events play particularly important roles in the development of autobiographical memory. Bruner has this idea of trouble as axial. And you go back to Asman on the idea of the fateful events in histories. They're very often negative. So with that in mind, I now want to talk about Wolheim. And part of the reason I want to talk ab about him is for years uh, there are concepts that are associated with psychoanalysis that are outré, but uh, I'm suggesting that we're probably at a time when psychoanalytic ideas can be re-looked re at in trying to bridge ideas uh, between culture and the neural. Um, and part of the reason for that is, he's an analyst as you will know, the boundary line between self and external world bears no relation to reality. The distinction between ego and the world is made by spitting out part of the inside and swallowing in part of the outside. 
Now these metaphors, uh, uh, as you know, are ubiquitous in, in um, psychoanalysis. But really what he's, it seems to me he's talking about is there are lots of different ways in which you represent the world. Uh, and some of those are, they're all edited. Um, and some of, it, it, some of that means uh, distorting what you take in and also ejecting things that are not harmonious with where you're coming from. So this idea is very evident in the example I'm going to give you now. Wolheim is somebody, I, I first came across him when he wrote a, a, a very influential book, and the philosophers amongst you will, will be familiar with, called Art and His Objects, in the late 1960s, early 70s. And he then was professor of, of uh, mind in, in University College London. And he uh, was unusual in that he was very sympathetic to psychoanalysis, and he, he has written on Freud. And then subsequently, uh, in the 1980s, uh, he wrote a book called The Thread of Life, his theory of what it is to be a person and uh, how it is that the continuity of personhood is established. Uh, and he also gave the Mellon Lectures, for those of you who are interested in art history, which were published in 1987 as Painting as an Art. Um, and towards the end of his life, he did a lot of very interesting work as an art critic, a bit like Danto. Um, there is the cover of a book that was published posthumously. It was published in, in uh, uh, the year after his death. Even though he had no difficulty getting his other books published, he had difficulty getting that published. But uh, he also felt that that was his best piece of work. And it's a, it's, it's, it's a memoir. And that's his mother on the right. That's him in the middle. But it's not his father on the left. That's Kurt Weil of Brecht and Weil. And that's relevant because his father was the impresario for the Ballet Russe and uh, a very close uh, business partner and friend of people like Diaghilev. So there's uh, young Wolheim. And the reason I'm showing you this is, for those of you who are in, in literature, you'll know that genre that has come out of with, with W.G. Sebald, you know, emigrants and so on, mixing photography and, and, and remnants and photographs. It's very interesting. And uh, that's something that connects, by the way, back to Asman. So uh, his, this book uh, is, 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 is reminds me of, of Sebald's work. So there he is with his mother and members of the Ballet Russe in 1928. That's him with Diaghilev. Uh, and he's the most uncomfortable looking kid being held by anybody you've ever seen. That's his father in the middle. And that's his mother. And there's a, a brother and a, dance, a dancer from the Ballet Russe. And that's his brother. And there's, yeah, I'm showing you this because I think you can even read then the intensity of the young Wolheim. His mother was a, a, a music hall uh, artiste uh, who married her husband, who was older than her. Uh, and that's her in the early 20s. That's the father who was, as you'll see, was highly fastidious. And that's the father later on. And that's with the brother. And that's a portrait by, of, of Wolheim with Ron Kitai. So what I want to do now is um, I want to uh, give you a reading of the memoir through the theory. And the memoir was published and written over the last 20 years of his life. His theory of self, which is dependent on memory, was written in the 20 years before that. So I thought it would be interesting to read his memoir through his own theoretical perspective. Now, for those interested in childhood um, and the ways in which it endures through selfhood, sometimes tyrannizing and sometimes nurturing, this memoir is particularly illuminating. And my own feeling is that it does add to the literature on selfhood and identity. Um, the lectures that became the thread of life were, in fact, the William James lectures delivered in, in Harvard in 1982. Uh, and he elaborated those at length. But uh, what he called the thread was what he was interested in. And for him, it was a certain type of remembering. Uh, he calls it experiential or centered event memory. And you'll see immediately why that is, is close to the sorts of ideas that you'll find in Tulving. And that idea of a centered event memory plays a central role in his account of the thread that runs through the psycho psychological life of a person. The 
I'm just going to skip uh, along here, but the, t the uh, two books, it seems to me, make a case for the continuity, the coherence, though not necessarily the unity, the centeredness and the general robustness of childhood structures of self right through life. So as such, it seems to me that they can be read as a counterbalancing to some more extreme postmodernist emphasis on self as fragmented, decentered, elusive, incoherent, ephemeral, and predominantly powerless. Uh, and I believe that postmodernist view permeates a lot of neuroscience accounts of, of self, just as it does lots of uh, postmodernist accounts of self. Now, there are, of course, senses in which the adjectives can be applied, these adjectives of the uh, postmodernists can be applied to manifestations of selfhood. But equally, you can match them with discourses of constancy, familiarity, and recurrence. Stability and changeability are not necessarily incompatible features of, in discourses of selfhood. The past in the form of memories and fantasies, woven, of course, into all the skills achieved in childhood, are central concerns of Wolheim. The coherence of a person's life as felt now is powerfully shaped by the ways in which his or her past shapes their present. And a constant preoccupation of Wolheim's is to understand why the past has this power to repeat itself in the present. Negative events, disturbing, painful or traumatic events have a notably repetitive dynamic as Freud well understood. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at a particular negative account in Wolheim's own autobiography and to see where that takes us. So in his review of uh, germs for The Guardian, the English novelist Alan, Hol Alan Hollinghurst describes the only time he met Wolheim, then in his 60s. And it was a, a dinner party given in Oxford by one of Hollinghurst's friends from Oxford, who happened to be the son of Richard, Wo <coughs> excuse me, the son of Richard Wolheim. And Hollinghurst writes, what I remember best about the occasion is the particular thing that had to be done before Wolheim arrived. Every scrap of newspaper had to be either thrown away or thoroughly concealed, not just findably tucked under a cushion. The mere sight of newsprint would make it impossible for him to eat his dinner. Now, what Hollinghurst picked uh, judiciously was one of the most striking and illustrative elements of Wolheim's way of living. Um, and it's the one that Wolheim himself leaves to the very end of his memoir before offering an account of necessity partial of his etiology. Wolheim had a, a deep understanding, as I said, of Freud, but he himself had been analysed for many years with uh, a Dr. S, as he quotes his pilot, in an attempt, he says, to sail back up the stream of my life. Um, so here we have an old man uh, writing in his 80s, or approaching rather his 80s, reflecting on an event that happened almost his full lifetime ago when he was about two and a half years old. Now, there's never any question in Wolheim's mind that the two and a half year old child and the nearly 80 year old man are continuously one and the same. Um, now, you could ask why that might be, because there are lots of examples where people mightn't feel that they are one and the same. And this is where his own theoretical perspective comes in, because he opposes what he calls constructionist theory, by which he means the type of theory arguing that an adequate account be, can be given of all events that make up a life without introducing the person who has them. He, uh, to the contrary, favours what he calls a non-constructionist theory, which holds that no event in a person's life, even taken singly, can be adequate, adequately described without introducing the person who has it. And on that view, you can't really consider questions of memory without considering questions of identity and self. Wolheim specifically argues that the influence of the past runs through dispositions, and they come to be set up in a person, and then they persist. And by a disposition, he means memories or fantasies, beliefs, desires, emotions, uh, as examples of the kinds he has in mind, trying to explain how the past uh, is uh, and the agents of the past continue to influence. So living, as in leading the life of a person, is for, uh, for him, as it is for so many other people thinking about this, an embodied mental process. But it's one shaped and constantly reshaped by the causal influence of what is perceived, what is understood, what is remembered, what is imagined, desired, and so on. So the intentional dimensions of subjectivity are crucial. So throughout Germs, throughout this um, uh, memoir, 
you've got lots of examples of the power of smell to both delight and repel Wolheim. And as we know, smell and disgust are very closely linked. And these can shift from one to another within seconds. So in his attraction to a woman, for example, a smell can change for him. Uh, he writes of an inundation of smell, a possibility of drowning. And here he is describing the worst that a particular smell, the one I mentioned, can uh, wreak for him. He says, however, one smell played and continues to play such a spectacular role in my life that no book would be about me if it did not refer to it. And, what is this? and that is the smell of newspaper. It is the most persistent thread in my life, stronger, more unchanging than any taste or interest, more demanding than any intellectual challenge, and I have never seen any way in which the power of love could transform it. It was like a ghost in a house that could be expelled only by demolishing the house. And he then records a memory, and I quote, which I have recently, after much effort, called out of decades of dormancy, and which he believes he can precisely date to a period when he was two and a half years old. And I mentioned some of that previous research about negativity to reinforce the legitimacy of the type of memory that he um, ca can recall. And I would also add that people like Catherine Nelson, who is not talking about Wolheim at all, but she, even though the, the uh, two-year-old or younger has this division uh, that distorts time between the present and the rest, she has no difficulties in saying, but of course the young child is fully capable of desiring uh, grieving and so on. So given Wolheim's attempts elsewhere to disentangle how sequences of what he calls iconic memory and imagination interpenetrate each other, and that's important because he sees emo uh, imagination and memory being close, he talks about iconic memory and he uh, makes a number of distinctions which I'm going to talk to you about now. But his recounting of the memory starts in a particular linguistic way. Um, and it begins in the present tense, and here it, it is tea time. The light of early winter is fading. And then at this point, he shifts to the past tense, and he gives this scenario. His nanny is reading a newspaper report on the death of Queen Alexandra, the Queen Mother. And here's the, the text again. At this point, my brother got annoyed. He could not bear my physical proximity to our nanny. Willem says his brother, who was then three years older than, than him, then anticipated that the nanny would want to pin the photo of Queen Alexandra on the nursery wall as a memorial, uh, and that his brother didn't want that either. So this is the retrospective memory given by Wolheim. To sabotage both wishes, says Wolheim, his brother surreptitiously seized a page of newspaper, tore it into small pieces, rolled the pieces into tiny pellets, placed them in his mouth to moisten them, and then began to flick them onto the page the nanny was reading, so that, and I quote, they clung to the page like the scabs in some children's disease, end of quotes. And he then observes that this was something that only his brother, but not he, could get away with. Uh, so as his nanny lowered the newspaper, quotes, to reason with him, his brother signaled to Wolheim that he wanted him to say that he was doing it. Wilhelm, again, in fact, writes the hypersensitive Wilhelm, I might easily have done so, for by this time the juices that had risen up in, into my mouth in sheer horror at the scene seemed to duplicate the taste of the little pellets in my brother's mouth as he rather awkwardly dipped them in his saliva, so it might have as easily been I as him who had done it. You can perhaps see mirror neurons at work here. The younger Wolheim then refused to take responsibility, and then he remembers the paper slipping from the nanny's hands onto the linoleum, where the face of Queen Alexander was, and I quote, now desecrated by, by spit and smell and the signs of disease, and it was hard to believe that death had come to the Queen peacefully. End of quotes. So, unlike, for the rest of his life, he's handicapped by this, but he doesn't remember it until late. So, Unlike the smell of newspapers, he, he, he muses, the smell of excrement doesn't bother him as much. It's, it's just normal. Why? He uses this phrase because it doesn't infiltrate the inner world, whereas this infiltrated his inner world. 
And by the way, he also generalizes this to other people. It seems inconceivable to him that other people aren't uh, capable of being as horrified a newspaper as he. As he. So it, it would be reasonable then to say that this is a significant identifying, uh, identity defining memory for uh, the philosopher Richard Woolheim. Um, if you look then at his work on the thread of life, uh, you will see some of the ways in which he tries to understand uh, how memories of a particular kind constitute identity. So we could ask what kind of memory is the long dormant memory of the newspaper incident retrieved so belatedly by Richard Woolheim? Did fantasy play a role in it? How does he connect himself as an old man retrieving the memory with the two and a half year old Woolheim who experiences the event that the elderly Woolheim believes lays down a lifelong aversive disposition? What desires, if any, might be satisfied or concealed? I, is it simply an early conditioned connection of disgust uh, to newspaper, or is it something immensely more complex to do with the early organization of Woolheim's own particular inner world? And again, I would stress the word disposition as against state. How am I doing for time, Merlin? Okay. Um, let's take the, the um, concept of a centred event memory. By that he means the sort of memory that y has you as the protagonist. So the memory is remembered as you doing it. An a-centred event memory is one in which you will remember it as an observer. You're looking at it. Uh, you're, you may well be looking at yourself in it, but you're not as closely connected to the memories uh, as a protagonist as, as with somebody else. He makes the same distinction between centred and acentred imagining. Um, so that if you imagine yourself as the participant in a, a, an imaginary scene, all sorts of things follow, particularly emotionally. And you can begin to feel things, he talks about the whole repertoire of feelings that would come up by virtue of that. They may not come up as strongly or as potently or with, as he says, such plenitude if you were to look at it in an A-centred way. And then he makes a number of other distinctions, but one of the ones it seems to me that is, is important is, and I, I may be wrong in, in my reading of the Freudians on this, but that there's a, an essential similarity and an essential difference between memory and fantasy. And we could think of something happens to me or I do something. Um, if it's significant to me, then I'll register it and I'll represent it in some way. And when I come to retrieve it voluntarily as a memory or when it intrudes into my consciousness or psychic life involuntarily as in a dream or a symptom, then it will once again affect me and in ways similar in some proportionate way to the initial event that gave rise to the memory. So in other words, the past event continues to influence me, me through the agency of memory. And that influence will not be as full as the original, but will be felt with varying degrees of cogency. Um, but the, the uh, similarity then is between memory and uh, fantasizing is that the influence of the originating event continues to be conveyed in both activities. The difference is that information is not carried by the fantasy, but it continues to influence. And it's a, a, an open question as to whether single events of this kind can cause lifelong dispositions, but I think the evidence is strongly there to suggest that it can. Um, I'm not sure now whether... That, by the way, is the age, maybe a bit older. I tried to find a photograph of Wolheim at about the time, but uh, probably about nine months after that, that he, um, w w this event that he recalls happened to him. So I'll just go back, if I may, for a minute. He says that it's still the neurotic's past that makes him suffer, but what is pathogenic is no longer to remember that, it is to forget why. It is no longer to remember what he did or what happened to him, it is to forget why he desired this or why he believed that. So there is a causal connection between the kinds of points of view uh, and a person's behaviour in both, and they're different. And the linguistic clue that he uses is the present tense. So, I imagined that the horse fell down in the street is to imagine a non-iconic uh, imagination of an event, whereas I imagined the horse falling down in the street is an expression of an event imagined iconically. 
And the distinction here is between iconic mental states that possess a point of view internal to that which they represent and those which don't. And those which possess such a point of view are those that he calls centred and those which don't are the ones he calls acentred. So in a centred memory of an event, I'm a player and as the player, the impact of the remembering on my current mental state will tend to be richer than if I remember from the point of view of someone merely observing the event. And he also says that an experiential event is something, is always of some event that the person has lived through. Uh, and the, the guarantor, if you like, of that being his is the uh, dynamic of centred event remembering. So how do you pull all this together? Um, I realise that I'm quite short of time, so if I can just move towards the end. I can give you an account of, of what I think happened, um, but uh, maybe I should leave that. But this is another point to the memoir, and it's a point about how you remember and the medium of remembering. So if you look at that, it starts, it is early, the hall is dark, light rims the front door. What do you notice about that? Each sentence is one word longer than the previous one. So I'm telling you this as, as partly uh, a cautionary thing because Wolheim conceived of this opening event in his uh, memoir many, many years before he wrote it, and he conceived of it as being one where the sentences got longer and longer until the fall they're describing comes, and he wanted the language to describe the fall. And then he says he explained this to a friend, S.S., whom I take to be C the poet Stephen Spender, uh, and Spender to told him, forget about that. But uh, what, what, uh, he, what Wilhelm then says, but I couldn't, and I lost 15 years. So I'm just... There's a lot more we can say about this man, uh, but here he is writing. So the act of writing about memory, as we can see in the construction of that particular memory, is highly influential. Uh, uh, so the medium, the external medium, is highly influential. So I'm just raised that question about the smell of a newspaper being a an, an maladapted procedural memory, but we leave that. So let's go back then to my initial question. How can a cultural memory become an identity constituting personal memory? And here we have the original um, um, image from uh, our friend Dali, but, but it, uh, this one now has the vanishing points put in. It's a very simple construction. So you have the vanishing points on the horizon line, so the viewer sees the depth in that way. So taking Dali's metaphor, what is the temporal horizon of uh, the, the vanishing points of kinds of identity shaping memory? So in terms of ordinary autobiographical memory, we might say it's two years, plus or minus. I'm not for a minute su suggesting that the infants don't remember. In fact, the most recent research shows that they're, they're capable of remembering at four months. And I suspect if you take into account familiarity and repetition uh, and recognition, it's much earlier than that. Um, the suggested uh, 80 to 100 years is uh, f that in oral history. Um, Asman talks about the, the Roman saculums, the maximum lifespan of somebody uh, who can remember a generation. Um, so my final question is, how might autobiographical memory, um, if I can see it, uh, work as a vehicle for enacting re and reproducing objectified, objectified cultural memory? Uh, and here's Merlin's um, diagram from uh, his book, A Mind So Rare, where you've got long-term memory, working memory, and then this vivid conscious core, external memory, and then the permanent uh, external symbolic storage. So m everything I've been talking about is in that box. So some elements of an answer. Um, Edelman uh, years ago suggested that remembering and imagining share similar neural pathways. Uh, we have evidence on source amnesia, where people forget the source of their, their memories. 
we have lots of evidence on distortions of memory and false memories. Um, we had a recent one in which was very interesting wh where uh, Freeman Dyson reviewed Dan Dennett's book on breaking the spell of religion and which some of you may have seen in which Dyson uh, recalled being on a train as a kid with a tortoise and uh, he talks about giving uh, talking to the um, ticket man as to whether you should pay for the tortoise and the tortoise says something like cats as cats and dogs as dogs but them's insects and they travel free so Dyson writes this in the New York Review of Books some months back. The next edition, uh, there's uh, both a, a, a strong letter and a punch cartoon sent in by Nicholas Humphreys from 1869 with exactly that event. So Freeman Dyson had recalled a personal event, put it in the New York Review, and then was told by his, his uh, antagonists, you know, its source. And then he subsequently had to, to disown that. Uh, so I'm just giving that as a recent example with Dan, Dan, Dan Dennett. Um, we know about the power of suggestion on processes of memory. We know about evidence on remembering a sharing and shared memories as re-remembered. Re Catherine Nelson's work has a lot on that. And we also know, uh, I'm, I'm arguing that uh, identity constituting memories, particularly emotional, may be uh, procedural in the way I'm describing. And we know that if you remember something as a centred uh, subject of the memory, it will be more rich and cogent and perhaps more effectful than if you do it uh, in a, an a-centred way. And finally, there's the question of the memory feeling like it's yours. So I'm just suggesting a sequence of possible ways of thinking and using Wolheim, um, putting all that together. I mean, if, you, if you're presented with a cultural artefact, let's say a memorial, a story or a song, that then becomes an intentional object for some people. Um, it prompts a-centred, or if it's more potent, centred imagining, and that then will associate with emotional or somatic uh, events which will mark that in some way. They're encoded as such and then they become available as uh, for a-centred or more potently for centred event memoring, remembering, and then they're subject to processes listed on the previous slides in terms of forgetting where they came from. So that might in time might become likely to supply information uh, might be less likely to supply information about the originating act uh, of culturally constructed centred uh, imagining. And then eventually the re-experiencing can come to seem part of the person's remembered self, uh, representing as, a, as an a-centred or more powerfully as a centred event memory. So my general conclusions then. Um, identities, whether cultural or personal, are primarily enacted and only secondarily had. Um, their architecture is substantially emotional, enabled by a version of some sort of procedural memory, which instantiates and reproduces the normative dimensions of cultural identity, and thereby reproduces what has been culturally memorialised. And then the relationship between cultural and personal identity, underpinned by cultural and autobiographical memory, is therefore symbiotic. symbiotic. Um, so a final question. What of the normative, the formative, and the contemporary youths uh, take on the potentialities of objectified representations and cultural memory in this age of U2 and Google Earth? And I don't know if anybody saw this uh, in the English papers. Uh, this is, I took this from the Education Guardian on January the 31st. But what had happened was that uh, the previous summer, when the kids in this school were graduating, they got weed killer and put a big penis on, on the grass. And then the school authorities immediately reseeded the grass. But then, of course, the grass died because the kids had used a potent weed killer. And then they went to Google Earth and they took the photograph of the school after they've left. And now that is part of the external memory system. Um, so I just think it's an interesting example. And this is a final thought from Merle and Thais, given their, their liking of, Merle, of Mark Twain. It isn't so astonishing the number of things that I can remember as the number of things I can remember that aren't so. <laughs> so thank you. Well, uh, thank you for that quite wonderful talk. And I'm sure that uh, uh, we have many questions, and I, I don't want to preempt uh, everyone. I've got about a, a dozen questions myself, but le let me open the floor initially uh, to questions. If not, maybe I will ask my question at this stage. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, you've made a very interesting case for, in detail, for the way in which cultural experience invades the most basic aspects of memory. And, uh, uh, you know, the, the question was asked earlier, how could it be that something as fundamental as episodic memory or even perhaps your base rate type memories could be influenced by, uh, by culture? And I think that you've made a very credible hypothesis, which is a, a great extension of what Damasio said when he proposed the somatic marker hypothesis. For those of you who are not familiar with it, Antonio Damasio is a very well-known neurologist, neurosurgeon, who proposed that memory, one of the most important aspects of memory storage in human beings are the, are the emotional tags that are attached to memories, which uh, in a sense prioritize them and also uh, affect very much the accuracy of your recall later on and so on. And um, the notion that you propose, I think, is much richer, which is uh, an architecture, an emotional architecture, which actually ultimately in a sense defines the self. And since selfhood has come up in Tolving's own notion, we start to understand the complexity of that idea in a way that perhaps even Endel Tolving doesn't, uh, himself perhaps hasn't reflected on because I think, uh, I think this is a very interesting synthesis of a, of a psychoanalytic point of view which for a long time was cut off from experimental psychology and from cognitive science completely cut off. And it's a very interesting recurrence, speaking of temporal recurrences that came up earlier, that, that this kind of insight, this kind of microscopic examination of how memories are acquired and how they infiltrate into the very depths of, of, of the self and the brain, and undoubtedly, uh, uh, or go about. So um, I, I want to just ask you um, a, a sort of left, out of left field question that you may not feel prepared to answer, but that's fine. Uh, but I suspect you will uh, answer it. And that is that uh, Tolving has made the claim, which some of us don't necessarily accept, but the, the claim is that only human beings have episodic memory. So we, we're the only ones that have kind of a, a time record of our own experience. And this gets back right to the early notion of time and time representation. Um, and that um, you're saying that much of that construction is influenced heavily by experience and by culture. Um, so what kind of evolutionary event could have caused such a radical shift? That is, uh, let's assume for the moment that he's right, that only people can do this. In fact, let's carry it even further and say, as you suggest, that only people who have some kind of language can do this, which actually does have some sort of basis. Uh, for those of you who have studied, uh, for example, uh, the case of Helen Keller or many of the cases of, of deaf people without language who acquire language later on in life. Um, so how uh, could it be that, uh, that something so fundamental has changed in recent evolution? Do you have any speculations about that? Well, I, again, I don't know much about uh, the neurology underpinning that, uh, that third form of representation that Damasio put in. They put it in 94, and I thought lots of people would pick that up mm -hmm. uh, because the, the problem of, 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 of accounting for self-presence mm -hmm. in a non-deduced way is, is, is an intriguing one, and that, that, that suggests, uh, and I think he was talking about the cingulate cortex as being in particular uh, a, a particular element of that. Now, again, I don't know, you would know more than that. But that, what I didn't go into, um, I be began by saying I thought that there were neural and narrative uh, reproductions. But one of the things that um, I find, again, interesting in, in uh, Damasio uh, is the hierarchy of forms of consciousness uh, from, from the proto-self, which is not conscious, basically mapping the body's thing, through core consciousness, uh, and then uh, extended consciousness is that he presents it as as uh, as a hierarchy, but he pre he presents it as a as a sort of command hierarchy, which he doesn't intend at all. It's much more nested. So at the very heart of autobiographical selfhood is core selfhood, and his argument is that every single um, uh, impact on 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 the unconsciousness whether it is perceptual or internal or external forces a recalibration of the mapping that is that and that is instant by instant so the and yet but it's done within parameters 
So the idea that you don't feel yourself today if you're feeling sick is, is, is an example in a colloquial way. So that continues. So everybody has that sense. It's, it's unchosen, it's just there. Um, and, and if you're thinking in terms of, of um, that singular perspective of the 18 month old or two month or two year old or less uh, being one from which you could uh, take as an intentional object some part of your own interiority. Uh, I'm not sure that there's, w I d I'm not sure how kids talk about that because if you're a Vygotskian, all of this is taking place outside. It's taking place in a shared world. Um, and by the time the child begins to be able to take those aspects of their own interiority as an intentional objects, they're already part of that shared world, which is linguistic. So it would seem to me in answering to your question, it w it, if, if, and I don't know, about th but th this idea of self-presence, I don't know how you would look at that. I presume in the end it'll, it'll be, it'll be uh, scanning in some ways that you'll be able to tell whether uh, uh, a high level uh, mammal, even like a dog, has that self-presence, uh, whether there's something, I just simply don't know. But I, I do feel that that might be one evolutionary dimension to it. But the rest, I think, follows from language. And uh, I think the uh, multiplication of perspectives from which you can then, which you can then occupy, uh, from which you can then take a, a central perspective on, on, let's say, a memory. And you, I think you can do that in varied ways. Uh, that would be part of the cultural evolution. That would Yeah. I was thinking about negative feelings about oneself, in a direct and negative feelings. Okay, well, there's some people are about <coughs> the, the, the idea of negative feelings uh, directed towards oneself, directed inwards. Uh, it's interesting relationship to the, to the primal traumatic event of all man's account of yeah. his uh, phobia about the newspaper. It seems to be largely about um, uh, just the, the, the sense of the sense of opposition Well, I, I, uh, I actually cut all that short. So, uh, so if I was to, if I, if I, in a nutshell, if I was to say what was happening and, and why I think he's probably right in thinking that it's not simply a conditioned reflex, which it could be, uh, and why it's more likely to be a complex part of his, what he calls his inner life, is this idea of collusion of events. And I think there were lots of, of things that colluded in that particular event, which he's rem remembering. And they would include, and I, I, had I time, I, I would have gone into it. He had an extremely difficult relationship with his mother, who uh, was uh, a woman who was wholly um, focused on herself. And the only humor in the whole thing comes out when he would say things like, um, uh, my mother didn't like other people talking to them, to each other, or things like that. So he, he was in this cosseted world. Uh, with a mother who was obsessed with germs, who had a cleaner, that's why he calls it germs, who he, she had a cleaner, but uh, the cleaner had to uh, keep all windows shut because the mother thought germs came from the outside. So ideas of inside and outside were hugely significant. He also had these fantasies about trying to, his father on the other hand, who was often very distant, very absent, was, was um, extremely fastidious. And the young Wilhelm was allowed to watch the father dress and how he had to learn how to put in uh, the uh, tails of his, his uh, shirt in one particular way. And then he says he was never allowed to go to the toilet himself. He was never allowed to defecate. And at one point when he was two, he was allowed to do it. And he was allowed under instruction if he folded the paper in a certain way to do this. And he said every time subsequent to that, when, you know, as a moral philosopher, every time he thought of moral responsibility, this kept coming back. This was the biggest moral act of moral responsibility in his life. Then he also had a rivalry with his brother. Um, and he also had this, he, as I said, he was, he was hypersensitive. In fact, I just met a, a colleague of mine in Georgetown, and I asked him, had he ever met Harry? Or, um, it was Ram Harry, and I asked him, had he ever met Richard Wolheim? And uh, he said he'd only seen them once or twice, but he, it, was, it was very hard to make eye contact with them. No, I, was, I was curious as to how somebody would, because Ram hasn't read his work. Uh, 
Um, and then there were other things. For example, he, he, if, if, if I had time, I would take up this idea of inside and outside because I think this is a really important construct. Um, but he has a fantasy of uh, trying to connect with his father. And the, f and the fantasy is uh, he urinates and then the father, without knowing, urinates. And then following up the stream of urine into the father goes Wilhelm's urine and into his brain. And then, there, the, he, and he says it's like the cavalry. And, he's, and, and that is a way of getting his father to know what he's like. Uh, so you have this, this uh, you know, extremely obsessional sort of training for this young guy. Uh, with all these other events, the rivalry with the brother. And then if you think of, of uh, Queen, Queen, Queen Alexandra is the Queen Mother. Now I'm not an analyst and I'm not, I'm not convinced by that, but you, you can see lots of colluded uh, fantasies and, and events colluding with desires and griefs. Um, so th for those sorts of reasons, the richness that he gives, that's why I think he's probably a more interesting account. But the point is, that my main point is, here is somebody right to the very end of, of a long life uh, for whom this is absolutely incapacitating. More questions? Yes. I was thinking of, of the, the general relationship between uh, uh, the two forms of uh, phenomenological past we have. One is uh, the uh, time death in the present experience, something like uh, the idea that the present contains what, what else has happened this morning, this um, over uh, lunch, and, and now in the afternoon, etc. And maybe a time that, that, that goes back to what else I did last night and what, what happened last week, etc. In a sort of continuity, that's still the present in a sense, and uh, doesn't qualify really for being remembered afterwards. So that's one thing. But the other thing is the, the real uh, remembered past that has been cut off from the time depth of the present and has been cut off by, I think it's a good idea uh, of Damasius to, to suggest that the uh, emotional tagging is doing uh, at least much of that work. But then uh, if we had two uh, versions of the past, the past in continuity with the present and the past in discontinuity with the present and rendered accessible through the tag, then there is a sort of uh, sign status uh, of that tag that uh, both um, uh, separates this, the uh, remembered or the rememberable uh, past event to the present and, uh, and separates it from it and, and connects it to it. And then I, I wonder um, uh, how the tagging uh, happens in fact. And uh, I could think of, of uh, the ways uh, in which uh, emotional uh, events happen to us as part of, of uh, an, answer in, uh, an answer to that question. Namely, uh, emotions happen very often in, uh, in interaction with other people. So that uh, I don't have to tag my people. I am being tagged by people that uh, induce emotions in me. For example, shame is something uh, easier to feel if uh, people shame you, etc., and shame me, etc. Then I, I, you, you should be ashamed of yourself. Okay, I'm ashamed, etc. Uh, it's something that comes to me, like the tagging comes to me from cultural interaction with people. And then, uh, of course, such a tag could be linked to other uh, socially circulating symbols that would carry the tag. So that a sign of a sign of a sign of a tag would still be a tag. And then we have, I mean, a conclusion according to which uh, culture is, is in fact responsible for most of, of what uh, the mind does in terms of memorable uh, past. So the, the, the cultural uh, functioning of it becomes completely predominant. And the, the opposite would, would then uh, maybe shed some light on uh, animal experiences of the past. If those are of the sort of the first sort, namely past events in continuity with the present, then it's uh, easier to understand how animals can uh, like uh, learn from their experience without communicating, namely by the time depth in their in their present. <coughs>
and also why they don't understand uh, our um, even domestic animals when we try to remind them of what happened last summer. So, <laughs> <laughs> they, they are looking for a, a tag somewhere. There's no tag. In this conference, Sarah Waller is going to be addressing that issue to some degree, but uh, Karen. Uh. I, I, I just pick up something on the margins of what you're saying, and, and uh, it's, it's why it is that people will engage in remembering at all. Uh, I mean, Charles was saying uh, about uh, the, the, the need to forget. I mean, the, and this is quite a, a large political debate. You know, as, as uh, must you move through truth and reconciliation uh, processes before you can uh, s fix things and then move on, or can you simply move on? Um, in Wilhelm's case, it's important. I think. I mean, I don't think he was remotely interested in trying to cure himself in any way. So his his retrieval of his memory wasn't about that at all. I suspect. Um, and uh, you mean there was a lot more I'd want to say about that. But um, one of the things is, as people are getting older. Uh, and it's a subtle point, I think, that uh, Simone de Beauvoir made, and I, I'll just quote. She says, the reason why the emotional memories that restore childhood are so treasured is that for a fleeting instant, they give us back a boundless future. A cock crows, and you'll note her first person here, so we have a centred event memory for her. Uh, a cock crows in a village whose slate roofs I see in the distance. I am walking in a meadow. All at once, it is Marynac and there's a catch in my heart. This day, now just beginning, stretches out a vast expanse as far as the distant twilight. Tomorrow is no more than an empty word. Eternity is my portion, and then it is not. Here I am, back in my days, when the years go by so fast. So recovering memories is, simply, is not simply about the past. It marks, at the moment of recovery, differential futures. And the cultural valuing of that is something that might relate to, to, to your question. Uh. Yes, uh, I want to uh, get back to the issue of the negative uh, uh, emotional uh, basis of memory and sense of self and so on. And uh, I want to, and, and I'm prompted by uh, reaction to the discussions that had taken place in the session before this. And in particular, my reaction to Yana's presentation, where I was struck at how there was one word that had appeared in many, many, uh, many, many times in the previous discussions that did not appear in hers, and that was the word representation. Then I'm starting to think about uh, this concept of the way we've taken representation and mingled it with memory, and then taken memory and mingled it with self. And the, your discussion of the negative emotion made me recall something, which I, I'm probably fabricating it, but I, I think I remember it. It was from uh, in an anthropological seminar years and years ago. And it was reading Evans Pritchard, The Noor. And I, how I was struck by the way that um, when it came to, to the indigenous groups, who were one group known as the fish people, and one group known as the cow people, trying to describe what it was about themselves that was unique and, in a sense, their, the self. It was always in terms of something about, for the fish people, it was something that the cow people were that they were not, yeah. and vice versa. And um, so I'm thinking, I'm wondering whether something about our vocabulary of representation and the linking of, rep of memory as representation and into self links self to some kind of sense of representations that are the self. Whereas I have, from reading Richard Webb way, way, way long ago, had this notion that maybe it is not so much a, a thing that is represented, representable, but a void that, it, that remains after we have said all the things that we are not. Right. <laughs> I, I, again, I, you forgive me if I come at it uh, as, as best I can marginally. Um, the, the, no, no, no. <laughs> the, the, 
the the distinction that you're making, the 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 the, 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 the idea of identity being not. We, we we know right from the word go that infants can see the world as apart from them. I mean, th there's a wonderful uh, little example in Daniel Stern's book, which I, I like. Do you know that example of the two Siamese twins just before they, they are um, separate? They're, they're, they're facing each other. They're joined superficially on the chest. But they did a little informal study with them uh, in terms of sucking thumbs. And you, know, you can't get much closer than having your Siamese twin stuck to your chest. So they, they, they were seen to suck each of their thumbs sometimes their own and sometimes the other. But if it was their own thumb that was pulled gently away from them, they went like that. But if the other, if their sibling's tongue, uh, thumb was pulled away, they didn't. So intuitively, there was a sense of difference. And this is why I give the Russia stuff on internal differences. So if you take it from, from word go, that you, d there are ways in which uh, you, you can perceptibly, and infants perceptibly can discern the otherness of the world. Uh, I thought for a long time, uh, as did the sorts of people who would argue uh, against the um, analysts, that that shot what was called you know, right into object relations theory. I'm inclined to think not now, for reasons we needn't go into. But by the time somebody builds on that and gets to the time that they can talk, uh, begin to talk, uh, and, and master the pronoun system, we, 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 we know that ambient prejudices whether they're class or racial or so on, they're kicking in at around two, so on. So the idea of, of us, them, which is such a primal binary, which you're, you're referring to, that, you, know, you can see how that very quickly and very in, in, with, with, with uh, uh, ver great virulence establishes itself, even to the extent, I mean, I, I, you're probably all familiar with the work of Henri Tajfel, the social psychologist, but uh, he was very much vogue when, when, when I was in college. And the, the simplest allocation of, of a person to a completely nondescript group of no import to them was sufficient for them to act preferentially towards members of that group as against somebody else. So th this, th there's something very primal in there. Now, in ter coming back to your representation, the, the question of, uh, of how you represent yourself, um, my, 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 my I'm, not, I'm not saying that the architecture is entirely emotional, but I think the fact that it is emotional has been under-emphasized. I've no doubt that there are, you know, it's, it's the categorical dimension is, is hugely important, but that categorical dimension depends on conceptual development, uh, assisted by narrative, uh, once you begin to, to, to sequence things in stories. So in terms of your representations, um, I suspect that the newer examples would all be capable of being uh, well explained uh, in terms of the narrative structures of their cultures without needing to go back. Uh, I, that's my suspicion. Yeah. No, I think that, <coughs> I think that uh, uh, at this point we should uh, uh, end this session and uh, I might say that uh, uh, we're serving a light Dinner. We're going to have a break and serve a light dinner upstairs for those who are staying uh, during that period. We can continue the discussion. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, Giran for a stupendous uh, presentation, very stimulating, very interesting, and we'll carry on our conversation through supper. Thank you.